I'm really happy to be here. This is kind of a special place for me, which is probably weird for you because you probably don't know who I am. But um, as Trevor mentioned, I was able to be here with you about a year ago. I think it was the same weekend you had men's retreat. Uh, to, to just be with you and share, it was on Hosea at that point. You guys were doing the prophets. But it was special for me because that was the first time that I had ever preached before. And so it was a really um, just a special opportunity that you gave me, and I will forever be grateful for that. Um, so you guys just kind of hold a special place in my heart. Um, and then I've been, um, been with a, uh, some of you, I think maybe your leadership team or something, uh, we went through the kind of the life track thing too. So I've been amongst you a few times, um, and I just wanted to tell you that, um, I don't know if you know this, but within a church community, uh, you're a church body right? And within a church body, there are spirits within that body um, that, and so I wanted to tell you some of the spirits that I've picked up from you guys, and that's that you are a very real group of people. You're very relational. You just like to kind of get to the heart of it and just have the conversation about it. Um, You're very laid back, and you're just, you just want to get to the meat of what Jesus has. Um, And so that has been my experience with you, and I think that's who you set out to be. Um, So that really is what I have gathered from you. And I love that because that's what I am. I'm a very real person. I just want to get to the, let's just talk about what we need to talk about. Um, Very relational. And so it's, it's fun and it's easy for me to be here with you. But it also made today a little bit easier because I had asked Trevor, um, are you in a series? Is there anything you'd like me to speak on specifically? And he said, no, we'll be in between, so whatever God is putting on your heart. I was like, okay, that's great. And then I was like, God, you're putting a lot on my heart right now, so you need to tell me exactly what you want them to hear. Uh, And so there's, there's this thing that God has been talking to me a lot about lately, and it just kept rising um, up as I was praying about what he wanted me to share with you. And so for me, tonight's a little bit different because I really just want to invite you into the journey that God is taking me on right now. So this is something that's very real for me. It's something that I'm really wrestling with and sorting through. But God has just been so faithful to just show me so much about it um, that I really feel like he just wants me to invite you in this journey. So I just want to share with you um, what he's been, what he has been putting on my heart. So before I get started, I just was wondering, is anybody tired? Yeah, some of you just spent the weekend without your husband, so I know that there's some of you out there that are legitimately tired. Um, But not like just right now, like in life, like exhausted, kind of like at the end of yourself, drained, emotionally spent. Do you ever feel like you're calling out to God and you're not hearing from him? And you feel like you're you're doing all of these things, and it's things just aren't clicking, maybe. Or you don't, like, you don't ha- ever really have mental clarity. Like, you never can get to that place where, where it's clear, and you can really think through a full thought. And I think it's because we live in this, this 24-7 mentality type of world. Everything is just going constantly, 24-7. Stores are open 24-7. Everything just goes and goes and goes and doesn't stop. And our lives go and go and don't stop, whether it be work or school or getting kids to sports or we have deadlines at work or we have projects or jobs or dinner or grocery or whatever it may be. We've got relationships. We've got church. We've got volunteering. We're constantly doing and we're constantly going because there's always something to be done. And a lot of these things are good things. Right? We're giving our kids opportunities by getting them places, or uh, we're serving at church, or we're trying to be present for our spouse, or be present for a friend. So there's these good things, but they just never stop. And then there's the not-so-good things that take up our capacity and our thoughts and our time. And some of them are actually to sort of try to cope with the fact that we're overwhelmed with the good things. But nonetheless, they're taking up space in our mind, in our hearts, in our spirits, in our time. And then add in the fact that we live in this world that's just constantly refreshing. Like we don't actually fully process thoughts anymore because we're so used to 
things just refreshing and a new idea or a new picture or a new thing coming into our, into our thoughts that, that we'd actually, like our brains are actually not fully processing things anymore because of what we're being exposed to, that everything's always new, it's always changing, it's always on the go. And so I just feel like we're living in this place where we don't stop. And because of that, we're not able to stop, and we're not able to hear. And so we're not able to hear from God. We're not able to experience and feel and rest in God. Because we've conditioned ourselves, the world has conditioned us, to not, to not be able to even get to that place that God created us for. And so I've been praying a lot about this. And God began in some really kind of funny ways to draw me to this answer. And so I just want to, again, invite you to journey with me as we look at what he has been showing me. Because it actually goes back to the very beginning. So in Genesis, God creates the heavens and the earth, right? There's light, there's darkness, there's water, there's land, there's birds, there's sea creatures, there's animals. He makes man out of the dust. He breathes into him. He makes a companion. In six days. And on the seventh day, God rested. And we read in Genesis 2, verses 2 and 3, by the seventh day, God had finished the work that he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it, he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. So in God's original creation, in a cycle of seven days, one of those days was to rest. So the actual creation, everything that he created, the way he intended the world to function and mankind to function, included a day of rest. Right? In that seven days, the rest was a part of his creation. And so this is how people lived. They lived resting on this seventh day. And then God's people become slaves. Okay, so they're in Egypt, and they are stripped of their humanity. They're just made into machines. They're working 24-7. They're not given the option to rest. They're not given a day off. They're completely stripped of all of that, and they work 24-7 for years and years and years, conditioned to live this way. And then God frees them. And when he frees them, he has Moses tell them this in Exodus 6, verses 6 and 7. He says, Therefore say to the Israelites, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. I will take you as my own people, and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. So not only does God promise to free them physically from, from Egypt, he promises to free them from the slave mentality. The mentality that they had developed that, that, they, that they were human. He wanted to give them back their identity as his children. And so he promised not just to free them physically, but to free them from that mentality, to remind them what it means to be a child of God, what it means to be human, what it means to be his creation. And so he does. He frees them, and he begins to, to help them learn to come back to the way that it was meant to be. And in that, he gives them the Ten Commandments. And, and in these Ten Commandments, the fourth one says, Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But on the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servants, nor your animals, or any foreigners residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them. But he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. And that's in Exodus 20, verses 8 and 11. This Sabbath 
this rest was a gift that God was giving them to remind them you weren't meant to be machines. You weren't meant to work 24-7. When I created you, when I created this world, you were meant to rest. On the seventh day, you were meant to rest. And so I want to remind you that you're not a machine. I want to remind you that you're mine. And I know how you were made. And I know what you need. And you need this day of rest. And so even through the provision of manna, he, he reprograms them, reteaches them through this manna that he doesn't send it on the seventh day. He provides enough on the sixth to retrain them because they had been conditioned not to. And we know how it is. God tells us these good things, and we, we recognize them, but it's so easy to fall back into what we're accustomed to, what, what is natural for us. And so even through, through the provision of manna, he begins to say, no, this is the cycle that you are to live on. The thing about the Ten Commandments is that it was all they ever needed to live in right relationship with him and with one another if they would have just trusted him. The Ten Commandments were given out of love to, to show them when, as, as long as you're on this earth, these are the things that you're going to want to stay. These are the boundaries. We set boundaries for our kids, right, out of love for them because we know what's going to protect them and keep them healthy and in good relationship. But that's what this was. It wasn't a restriction. It was a gift that he was giving them. But in their human nature, and we're the same, their, their need to control, they started adding all these caveats and all these amendments, and all these additional laws, and all these extra things to everything. Because they, they need to feel in control, or they need to feel like justice was made, or they need to put more boundaries on that person. And so all of these loving boundaries became these laws, these restrictions, these things that, that were um, bound by, instead of a gift. And so by the time we get into the New Testament, the Sabbath had really become a law. It had become a restriction, not the loving gift that God had given people. And so it's one of the ways that the religious leaders try to get Jesus, try to corner him. So there's six times where the religious leaders try to get Jesus for, for doing something on the Sabbath he shouldn't be doing. But what's interesting is, the way Jesus responds to them, he, he doesn't care about the details. He doesn't address the details they're trying to get him on. He goes big picture. What is the purpose of the Sabbath? To honor God and to rest. The things you're trying to get me on, those are your rules. That's not what we gave you. Because it's big picture. Because it was a part of how we were created to live. And then after Jesus, his resurrection, he goes back to heaven. See, when Jesus came, he created uh, unity for all people. All people can come to this saving grace, Jews and Gentiles. And this was a very new concept for them. And so in the early church, the question came up from the Jews, well, Okay, but these Gentiles, okay, we recognize that they receive, but what about all the laws? What about the, all the things that we've been doing? What about all these things? And the, so this main one, the circumcision, comes up. Well, do they have to? Do they not have to? And so it kind of becomes this, this thing, because, of course, it's a law, and they have to wrestle with that and feel like they're in control. And so we have the Jerusalem Council in Acts 15, where they really just kind of talk it through, and they say, you know what? Jesus came, and he, he fulfilled the law. The work that needs to be done is done internally now. So we don't have to abide by these laws. We, we don't have to, to do these things to earn anything because Jesus has already done everything. Praise God, right? Except the Sabbath was never meant to be a law. It had become a law because of all of these ways that they had tried to be in control. 
the Sabbath was supposed to be a gift. But over time, it became, I, I associated it as a law. Until God began doing this work in me, subconsciously, I don't know that I'd never, ever necessarily thought about it, but we, we, we bulk it in with all of these things that were considered law. But as he's taken me on this journey and I begin to see, it was never meant to be a law. It was a gift. It was a gift. It was how we were created. We were not meant to go and go and go. Rest was something that we need. And so we see this in the life of Jesus. He says, the Sabbath was made for humankind, not humankind for Sabbath. It was made for us. God created it for us as a gift. And then in the life of Jesus, we see rest as a key component of his life's rhythm. Over and over in the Gospels, we read about how Jesus went away to a quiet place to rest or to pray or to be with God. He'd remove himself to these, these quiet places because he knew that he needed that. He knew that, that he needed that rest. He needed to pray. He needed to hear God's voice to give him direction for where he was taking him. He needed to remain connected with God so that he didn't fall in to the temptation from the enemy. He knew that he needed that. And as I was thinking about this, I couldn't help but just think, Jesus had to have been so keenly aware of how weak his flesh was compared to God. He'd been there. He knew. He knew how much his flesh could not make it without resting in God. He wasn't a fool. He knew something that we just can't quite grasp. And so Jesus regularly went away to rest, to get to a quiet place, to hear from God. Even when he was doing good things, there were times where he would be healing, he would be doing miracles, he would be teaching, and then he'd remove himself to go pray. And then sometimes he, he would just keep going to another place. And you have to think, Jesus knew that his time on earth here was limited. And if we have any sort of passion stirring in us for this world to know Jesus, you have to think that he had that same longing to do as much impact for God's kingdom as he could when he was on this earth. But he didn't let that keep him from resting. He didn't just push through. He didn't just keep going because he doesn't have that much time. He's just going to do as much work. Even in the urgency that he knew very well was in front of him, he still rested regularly. And I just think that if we look at how much Jesus valued rest, how do we think that we can go 24-7 and not lose our connection with God. Or stop hearing God's voice of direction in our lives. Or falling prey to what the enemy is trying to do in our lives. Jesus knew what God had to offer. And he took advantage of it. And he turned to it regularly. And yet we live in this world that has deceived us. To think that what, what we need to do... To, to live out this calling or to do good things for, for the Lord or to provide for our family is to do, to do, to go, to keep accomplishing more. And yet what happens is if we don't ever stop, then we, can, we never can actually separate for ourselves that God's love is not connected to our works because we're never actually not working. We're never actually not doing. So to receive God loves you, you don't have to earn it. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to work for it. Is a completely foreign concept to us because we, we're, we're not ever not doing and working. Right? And so 
this day, this Sabbath day, was set apart so that we could remove everything that's consuming us and distracting us and taking our attention and to weekly be reminded of God's strength, to weekly be able to hear from him, to teach ourselves, to allow God to teach us how to be still to a level that some of us may have never actually experienced before. This day allows us to reflect on his goodness, to look back on the week and to see how he was faithful, to see how he was present. It's an opportunity to reset so we don't get so far off course before we realize it. But instead, it's this regular rhythm to breathe in and stay focused on the mission that God has for us. It reminds us that we can't and we shouldn't even try to do all things or be all things to all people because we're stopping every single week and getting still. Everything's removed from our plate. Everything's removed from our mind and we're just in the presence of God. So we hear from him. We remember that he is our provider. We entrust ourselves to him. And we are then able to connect with him in this, in this way that we long to. We read in his word that he offers peace and he offers rest and that we can trust him. And I think that we all really do to the capacity that we're able to. But there's this level of experiencing God and what he has for us that if we don't rest, and we don't make that a part of our normal way, we, we can't actually still long enough to receive it. Which I believe is why he made this a part of the rhythm that we were created to live under. It was his original creation for us so that we could have a healthy life and live in freedom. See, when he freed the, the Israelites from Egypt physically and then promised to free them from this slave mentality by reminding them that this, this Sabbath that he created was a gift and it was for them, that they were designed for it and that they were his children and he was giving it to them. But for you and for me, I'm talking about this and we're thinking, that sounds amazing. Like a, like a fantasy, right? It's, it, it sounds great, but we're thinking, there is no way that I could do nothing for a day. I have too much to do. There are too many things on my plate. I would love to take a Sabbath. It's just not realistic. Anybody have that thought while I'm talking? Because I have it. Um, but could I ask a question? Are we not then slaves to the things that are telling us you can't take that day? Are we not just like the Israelites in this slave mentality to all of the things that the world is telling us we have to do? That we, we can't, you can't take that day. There's too many things you have to do. That's that voice, that's that lie that has made us a slave to think that we can't have this gift that God has for us. And I get it. And that's why I told you, I'm asking you to journey with me. Because right now, I'm working full time. I'm getting my master's. I've got three kids. My husband just switched careers. Life's full, really full. And God's revealing this to me. And I'm thinking, that sounds awesome. That makes sense. How in the world am I going to do this? And then I just thought about tithing. Tithing is something that God calls us to. And he says, test me. And we don't tithe when it makes sense in our bank account. We don't tithe once we get things figured out. We give him our first and we trust him to provide. And he is faithful to do so. 
And I just think about this. I think if God created me for this, then I'm not going to let any lie, anything get in the way. And I'm going to trust that he will provide. Because if he could create the entire world and all of creation in six days and rest, I'm pretty sure he can help me accomplish everything that I have on my plate in six days. Maybe some things need to just get off the plate. But if he created me for this and I'm longing to get to this place with him, I can't ignore the fact that he is saying to us, I created this for you. It's a gift. But we have to choose to receive it. And as long as we keep working and working and going and doing, I don't think we'll ever fully experience God the way that we have access to on this earth. Because this wasn't the way that it was meant to be. This is what our culture is telling us. Just because all of the businesses decide that 24-7 is going to make them more money doesn't mean that we have to then live under this 24-7 mentality. We need to follow the design that God gave us, not the design that the world is telling us is going to make it more productive. We were meant to rest. And when we work and we work, we just miss it. Paul tells us in Ephesians, God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. It's not in the things we do. It is simply in believing and abiding in Jesus. And I just don't think that we can fully do that if we are not conditioning ourselves to know how to rest, to make it a normal part of our way the same way Jesus did. Listen to what Isaiah says in Isaiah 30, 15. He says, this is what the sovereign Lord, the Holy One of Israel says. Only in returning to me and resting in me will you be saved. In quietness and in confidence is your strength. But you would have none of it. God is saying to them, I made a way for you to be able to truly experience all that I'm telling you is for you but you will have none of it. And I think that this can apply to us today too. He's saying, I know you're overwhelmed. I know you're stressed. I know you're exhausted. I know you can't function at work because you're so tired. I know that being at home, I know you want to be more present. I know you want to be filled with more joy, but you're just, you're at your limit. I know. And I made a way for you. But you'll have none of it. You're choosing to have none of it. This gift of rest, not a restriction, this gift of rest is available to us. And I just think the enemy is like loving this. He has us so at our tipping point. Because when we don't take this rest, we, and we just keep going, we, we're so easy. He just has to, like, flick us with some small little lie, and we just fall over. It doesn't take much to get us off because we're tapped out. We're exhausted. We're spiritually exhausted because we're praying, and we're praying, and we're knocking on God's door, and we're going after it, and we're not seeing the change. And he's just saying, I'm here in the resting, but you're choosing not to come. I was baptized when I was three months old, and I grew up living the Christian life. I never walked away from the church. Living the Christian life is all I've ever done. So in the last couple months, as God has began to reveal to me this, this element of his creation, that it's not some Old Testament law, that it's not some, 
overly religious practice, but that it was the thing that I was meant to function, the rhythm of the life that he created me for, I felt lied to. I felt punched in the stomach. Like the wind was taken out of me. That like violated dirty feeling where like you've been robbed and the idea that somebody was in your house and it's just kind of like, that's what I felt. Because I'm thinking, oh my gosh, how did I live? No wonder this happened. No wonder I was stressed. No wonder, no wonder, no wonder. It makes so much sense. Because this idea of, of resting, as appealing as it is to your souls as I'm talking about it, and I'm reading God's word, it's because we were made for it. There's something in us calling out and longing for that. And God is saying, you know what? The rest of the world might choose to keep going, but you're mine. And my children get special things, and I'm telling you, you get a day of rest. I'm giving it to you because you need it to remain in intimacy with me, to hear my voice so that you don't go off too far. Come back to me and rest in me. Take this day. But here's the kind of bummer part about this. Um, this is one of those frustrating messages where you're like, okay, tell me how. And I'm not going to. Um, partly because, like I said, I'm on this journey. But really the reason why I, I'm not, I'm not going to give you any practical steps is because I don't want this to feel like something you're supposed to be doing. I don't want this to feel like a burden. That's what got this into trouble in the first place. I'm not going to tell you what day you're supposed to do it on. I'm not going to tell you what you're supposed to do and what you're not supposed to do. It's not about that. It's not about the rules. It's not about the restrictions. It's about the resting. It's about honoring the day. In Romans 14.5, it says, One man considers one day more sacred than another. Another man considers every day alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. See, the, the Sabbath keeping is not... It's not meant to be a law. It's meant to be a spiritual freedom. Something that you should be fully convinced of and desire. So I'm not going to give you these practical steps where you feel like, man, there's another thing I have to do. But I'm inviting you on in this journey. Begin to do your own reading. Get into the scriptures for yourself. I've read a few books. I've talked to different people. I've started this journey because when I do this out of desire, because I am convinced that this is what God is calling me to, is when it's going to actually feel like rest. I will say that it's going to look different for everybody. What feels restful for you may not be restful for somebody else. What day works for you may be a different day than somebody else. This isn't a comparison thing. This is between you and God. Turning to him and saying, I get it. I see that I missed something. I want to receive this gift. Can you help me? And it'll take a while. It's going to take a while to condition us back to the way that, that we were meant to be. But I am fully convinced that this is our answer to intimacy with God, to hearing his voice, to living as a freed people, freed from the burden and the lies and the oppression that we experience in this earth. God says, you're mine, and I freed you. The rest of the world, they keep living like that, but you don't have to because I freed you, and so you have this gift that I'm giving you. In Isaiah 58, 13 and 14, it says, Keep the Sabbath day holy. Don't pursue your own interests on that day, but enjoy the Sabbath and speak of it with delight as the Lord's holy day. Honor the Sabbath in everything you do on that day and don't follow your own desires or talk idly. 
then the Lord will be your delight. I will give you great honor and satisfy you with the inheritance I promised to your ancestor Jacob. I, the Lord, have spoken. God, we just come to you right now, and I pray for every person in this room. I pray that your spirit would just be released. God, would you convince us? I pray against every lie right now that is trying to take captive any person in this room. We just say to you right now, you have no place. Spirit of fear, every lie is removed in the name of Jesus. God, you have created us for this. And this world is telling us that we can't do it. It's not realistic. So God, this is our moment to step on the water, to trust you, to be bold, and to receive the fullness of what you have for us. So God, would you go before us? Would you show us your faithfulness? And Lord, may we just come to know you and experience you and receive from you and trust you and allow you to guide us as we set this day aside and say, it's all about you. We trust you. We love you. We don't want to do this on our own anymore. So God, guide every person in this room. Every stirring that's taking place, God, join them on their journey. And I ask you to continue to partner on mine as I just press toward you, ready for the more that you have as I receive this gift of rest. Amen.